So that, that's being distributed. I'm Wu Yun Dalren. I was elevated in the Kingdom of Meridiais and now I live in North Shield. Uh, I started with my Chinese persona roughly in uh, 2008. Um, I don't speak or read Chinese, so I have a lot of extra special challenges in my research. Um, I'm one of the moderators for the Eastern Gate, which is a Facebook group devoted to study in, in Sinology in the SCA time period. I provided a link for that on the Google Doc that's been handed out. Uh, I want to get immediately into the nuts and bolts of the class. Let me start by saying this is by no means a history class. This is, this is not to discuss the, the, the distinct history of, of any of this. This is a hands-on class on how to shoehorn a Chinese submission, specifically a Chinese submission, into the Euro Eurocentric process that is the SCA College of Heralds. So uh, the handout was written roughly with a, in, the, in the voice of speaking to a submitter. So those of you that are experienced Heralds that are here to look for suggestions on how to counsel your, your Chinese personas wanting to register. The, this will give you some ideas. Um, this is born out of my years of experience. It is, it is not highly technical. It is, it is merely uh, the best practices on my journey as a herald dabbling in Sinology. Uh, the, through the years, we've had suggestions on creating a whole other college just for extra European personas. I use extra European instead of non-European because that language is more inclusive. There, there's, no, there's no reason to do that. We have a perfectly workable system, even if it's not entirely historically accurate. Um, there have been discussions over the, the last couple of years that uh, dabble in, in where this crosses the line into appropriation. I had a discussion with a user online not long ago where their argument was, well, as long as you don't look stupid, do whatever you want. I can't condone that particular line of reasoning. Uh, their, their argument was, well, the European personas won't know the difference. It, unfortunately, as representatives of an extra European culture, that's it's our job to represent as best as possible. Otherwise we are dabbling in appropriation and we can have a discussion on what does and does, doesn't cross the line into appropriation later in the class if we want to get into that discussion. So uh, uh, I was- Hugh in Zenyu is currently trying to ask a question. If okay. you'd like to unmute or they'd like to unmute. I'm terribly sorry, I can't hear you. You were breaking up a lot there. You're doing great, Who? I'm sorry. Technology has failed us. So I'm going to go ahead and go on and we can get whose question shortly. Uh, the important takeaways from the class are, is not that the college is prejudiced against the extra European personas. It's not that. It's just that the, this, this particular system that we have is based on a Eurocentric college and we have to shoehorn a practice into that system. Now, we have created some processes that do help with that. Uh, there are ways to make that system better. I encourage you to reach out to other more experienced heralds. And if you have common sense research rules changes that you'd like to propose, please contact me and I will help you work on those. John, would you mind awfully to read her whole question to me, please? Okay. It says... I'm a baby Skadian, and I, as a white person, am concerned about how to navigate the tricky waters that can surround having a Chinese persona. How do you do it? That's a really great question, and I would like to talk about that at the end of the class. So don't let me forget. Uh, the other thing that I would encourage people to take away from this class is I really encourage you to be flexible and willing to make compromises. Uh, Everything has to be done within this system, but once it gets out in the world and it's past the college, um, we can, there are certain things that you can do. We're going to talk about artistic license and other forms of representation. 
So be flexible, be willing to make compromises. I understand that your name and your armory in the SCA is a very deeply personal choice. Uh, we are a unique group in that, unlike period heraldic practices, you're allowed to choose, which is great. It also leads to exec some executive dysfunction and the knowledge that what you necessarily are interested in may not necessarily be period, but that's the, one of the great things about our game is that as long as you're giving it your best shot, you're, you're ahead of the curve. Uh, you have every right to change your name if you find better research. Uh, I encourage you to do that. My Chinese name had probably five different iterations before I figured out exactly what was the closest to what I wanted and what was the most period. So I have scrolls with all different name associations on them. As a person, you're allowed six names and six pieces of armory, so there's a lot of flexibility there. If you want to keep an old Chinese name and do your new one, you're welcome to do that. All you have to do is pay your fee. There's no, there's no um, punishment for changing your mind. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, uh, well, let's just get right into the basic considerations of choosing your Chinese name. You must have two elements to register a name. If you want to be Wu Ming, which literally means no name, it's what it means, and it was a common name for orphans. Uh, a good example is Jet Li's character in the movie Hero. He's called Wu Ming throughout the movie. If you're watching the, the Chinese language version, uh, and that's because his character is an orphan. Uh, we'll definitely use things like the branch name allowance to to get to get you something that's registered. Uh, so if you if you want to be Wu Ming of on Stiora, then then as long as there's not another Wu Ming of on Stiora, that's great. And we can, if if Wu Ming of on Stiora is taken, we can get you Wu Ming of, of wherever you grew. Does as long as it's a registered branch name, we can use it. Um, you must have a name to register visual heraldry, and I use the the term visual heraldry instead of armory because there's no, there are not bestowed arms in China. So this is be your visual heraldry. Now, it, does it convey the same meaning? It does say, yes, here I am, but it's, it's a slightly different idea behind yes, here I am. Um, if you do not check create a holding name on your forms, your armory will get bounced. I highly encourage everybody as you're, as you're going through your form to check to, to leave do not create holding name unchecked. You definitely want to do that. Um, you, you can always change it later. While, while things do get set in stone for database purposes, that's just a tracking thing. That's not, nothing is ever set in stone. We can always fix things. You cannot use your persona, your persona story to, uh, can't use your persona story to document your name. Uh, that's, that's, we have to tell people that all day, every day for, for European personas. So it's not uncommon to run into that consideration. Uh, this is the important part. I had a consultation over Discord with a, a person who wanted a very specific name. And they were concerned about the name characters that they were gonna use. The college doesn't register your characters uh, because there are different characters for different sounds that have different meanings. If you want to document one set of characters and then use another set of characters, as long as those were also named characters, you're welcome to use those out in the world. The name characters that, uh, thank you, Meryl. Um, Meryl's dropped a link to the Chinese Biographical Database in there. And I apologize for not having that in your handout. Again, I completely rewrote it from scratch, mostly from memory and a, a worn out copy right before class. Um, like I said, you can't, it, it, we don't register your characters. They're, they're nice to, to have because they help us with dates. You have to have dates for your name particles. But the college doesn't care if your name characters were a character. Um, so people get, get really hung up on their characters. What they're concerned about is does your transliteration match from one name to the, from one name to the next? You can't use a Wade, Wade Giles description in one name particle and 
opinion in the other. It, the, we're, we're looking for consistency. But nowadays, you know, unlike when I started, it's pretty easy to, to, to find a comparable transliteration. You have to date your name elements. Don't take it for granted. Never take dating any of your name particles for granted. Uh, and that's in European names. Always date your name elements. Uh, because Chinese names do tend to be uh, monosyllabic in their in their particles, it behooves everybody, but especially Chinese and a lot of Asian personae, to file a blanket letter permission to, to conflict. And while you're at it, do your heraldic will too. Always, always, always do those. So I want to move on to basic considerations in Chinese visual heraldry. I do want to stress that this class was meant to be a workshop. So who, if you're not sure what a heraldic will is, contact me after the class. My email address is on the Google Doc, and I will be happy to help you with that. Basically what it says is what happens to your intellectual property, namely your, your name and uh, armory, after you die, so that people don't have to worry about that. So please, please, please do that. I'll be happy to help you with that. Um, basic considerations in Chinese visual heraldry. Chinese heraldry and European heraldry, at their very core, are the same thing. They are a method of identification. Now, that's where the similarity ends. Uh, and again, mostly for upper and ruling class people. Unlike truly period European heraldry, uh, Chinese heraldry does incorporate symbology. We're, from what we know now, the Victorians ascribed a lot of symbology to heraldry, and, and we know that that's not necessarily the case in a lot of cultures, European cultures and period. There is no Chinese College of Heralds. Uh, the closest thing that we have to a Chinese herald is someone that was invested with the authority to speak for the emperor on very specific terms. Uh, there, there's, there are not people who wander around researching, registering, and bestowing heraldry. So there are some things that are the same between Chinese heralds and uh, European heralds, but they have to do with administrative functions, not necessarily what we ten tend to think of heralds in the SCA as researching names and memory. There is no height of heraldic practice in China. Um, the, the symbology is traded, used, updated, added to all throughout the SCA period because there's no College of Heralds to, to regulate that. Uh, there is no system of bestowed heraldry in China. There are extensive sanctuary laws but there are not, um, and there are some things that do get handed down, much like in the Mon tradition of Japan, but, but not like we tend to think of them in the SCA. You must, you must draw your charges so that they are identifiable in a European College of Heralds. That means that if you want a specific kind of fish like we're used to seeing in in Chinese art, you're gonna register the, the kind of fish that looks the closest to what you want, and then you're going to draw it like a Chinese fish later. That's artistic license. As long as you are not changing your device fundamentally by adding a thing, taking away a thing, changing a color, changing the, the way that a border looks, then you then you can do that. If you want, if you register a dragon and you want to draw your dragon, the the body of it looks like not work, not Chinese, but still a cool tattoo. Please please feel free to do that once you're out in the world. But your your device, the way that it has to hit wreath, is that it needs to look identifiable to a European identifiable. Excuse me, to a European herald. Those are the breaks. I wish I could tell you something different. Yes, Mr. Sylvie, this is this is the China talk. And thank you for joining us. It's very nice to, to see your name in the chat. Um,
the let's get down to the brass tacks of what the submitters want. The submitters want to know what symbols are most prevalent and and what they can can use the most. Uh, I encourage people to go with the four symbols. Uh, it's referred to as she, I'm going to butcher this and I'm sorry. I'm Southern, again, I don't speak or read Chinese, but my nearest approximation, approximation is Si Xing Ying, Si Xing, I'm very sorry. Uh, the first symbol is the Azure Dragon, referred to as Xing Ying. Associations are water, rain, power, and the East Cardinal Point. Uh, dragons with five toes are reserved specifically for the emperor. I have seen submissions get bounced because they have five toes. Just draw it with, with, with three toes and you'll be fine. Um, I disagree with the idea that something should be bounced for the visual weight of a puzzle, but I'm not wearing the big hat. Um, dragons are one of the oldest symbols in China and I apologize for my phone dinging. Dragons are one of the oldest symbols in China, along with the cicada. Cicadas are a really good symbol of uh, longevity. They're one of the first times that we see a cicada is roughly the same time period as a dragon. Um, so we see that insect in embroidery. Dragons are depicted as early as uh, 1046 BC. Uh, it's entirely appropriate to have uh, dragons and tigers left in, in particular struggles. So, because it's, you know, according to legend is, is the thing that we don't like to hear as a Chinese researcher because that means that nobody knows where it started and we don't really have documentation for it. But according to old legends, uh, dragons and tigers are part of a celestial battle that keeps, keeps the order of the heavens. Uh, the white tiger, Bahu, uh, is associated with protection, balance of power, and the west cardinal point. Also an important charge to the, to the Mongol people. Uh, we saw the tigers painted on the Mongol rattan shields because the, the Mongol word for tiger and the Mongol word for protection, which I cannot pronounce, are, uh, they sound roughly the same and a lot of East Asian cultures like puns related to how words sound. Um, the vermilion bird often gets confused for a phoenix. It is not a phoenix. Uh, they're associated with fire nobility in the south. The Chinese analog of a phoenix is called a fenway, and while they're both legendary creatures, they're not the same thing. The fenway is the critter that was associated with the empress. The vermilion bird is more like a, a guardian or a, a gatekeeping entity. Uh, the black turtle, also referred to as the black warrior, is a, a, a turtle, but more importantly, a long neck turtle, and sometimes depicted. Uh, know who you cannot. I wish I could tell you differently. You cannot use a feng huang in your heraldry because that is um, reserved for the Empress of China. Um, so this, this turtle is depicted as a, long, a specifically East Asian long neck turtle or with a serpent wrapped around his body and together they're one entity. It's not like there's a name for the serpent and the name for the turtle. Also an important uh, critter to the Japanese said that the black warrior guards the gates of Kyoto. Um, I'm going to need John to read that question here in a minute because I can't read all of it. So I've included some pictures that demonstrate a little bit of visual heraldic practice in China. You can be mad at me for including a movie. I like the visual representation in John Wu's Red Cliff because as movies go, pretty close. It's not terrible. Uh, there's a lot worse. And uh, they have really nice clear depictions of old banners and the armor is pretty good. So one of the things I want to point out in this picture is over on the right hand side behind the head of one of the black horses, you'll see the embattled edges of, of the banners. And you can see them a little bit better in the Tang Dynasty picture from uh, the Mogao Caves just below it. My own personal banner has the, um, also has the, the streamers. You could definitely fudge the look of those streamers with some creative embattled ordinaries in your devices. Um, it, the, importance is, the importance of this class is giving you options to get creative. 
to create some visual hacks to give you the aesthetic. Uh, so the, the, the battle itself, we're not entirely sure exactly where it occurred, but we do know that it happened roughly in 208 during the Common Era, just before the end of the Han Dynasty. Again, it's a movie. You can't use it for primary documentation, but it, but it definitely gives you the visual idea of, of kind of what you're going for. And this shape of, of a lot of taller than it is wide with the embattled streamers persists throughout the SCA period. This is a very correct banner shape for, for much of the Chinese period, much of SCA period China, please excuse me. So the next picture is a detail of uh, a Tang Dynasty cave painting, specifically from Mogao Cave number 156. And I like this picture because it has a lot of different banners in the same picture. And you'll notice that there are the, the streamers out from the edges. I want to emphasize the importance of a central, roughly circular charge. Um, mostly throughout the SCA period, there's a particular reverence for the sun and the idea that China is, is a central entity. So those are all meant to evoke a, an idea of centrality. Uh, you'll note now, obviously there's been some color degradation over the centuries. So we're, we, you know, we, we have an, a guess as to what the colors of these originally looked like, but you'll notice that golden yellow color on the larger banners. Black is always a very appropriate color. Uh, and then the next picture, this is, this is pretty far away from Tang Dynasty because this is the, the uh, Ming Emperor Wanli's carriage. I've given you the link to see the whole panorama of the, um, the so that you can go look at all of the banners throughout the, the, the whole scroll. Uh, some nice fodder for you scribes out there too. There's some, this is a really nice clear scroll. So I want to draw your attention to the banners on the back of the emperor's carriage. These are all dragons of different colors. They're just, they're just strewn on there. Uh, if you look at the wheel of the carriage, um, roughly down to the left of that, you'll see a triangular blue banner with a red charge on it. While they, while Chinese visual aesthetic does tend to to go along with uh, metal on color and color on metal, there are instances of colors on colors. So there are a couple ways that you could get an IAP for some of your submitters on this, just like we do with, with black and red for German. So it's, it's not impossible. I personally haven't done one yet, but it's theoretically possible. And then just below that, you'll note the, the banners with the long streaming tails that has, that has just one long streaming tail on it. Um, and these were specifically banners for the White Tiger Fighting Company. So those are White Tigers on there. Um, I've given you a very short list of sources and a very short list of, of inspirational items. The uh, British Museum link at the, at the, that's the very last entry, that gives a little short write-up on a lot of the charges. <clears throat> The only thing I don't agree with is they've included that uh, the Phoenix and the Vermilion Bird are the same thing and they're not. But it's the British Museum, it's not the Chinese Museum. Uh, I do want to caution people using uh, Garnet's Daily Life in China on the eve of the Mongol invasion. This hasn't been updated since the 60s. It's a nice jumping off point and there's some really good pictures in it, but I wouldn't camp out and live there. Uh, I do have a link to Yin Mei Li's article from the Wayback Machine. It, for me, it works about half of the time. It could work for, for more people than me. It's probably my internet service provider. Uh, I have Mr. Katsumori's Chinese onomastics article. This is kind of what we, this is our, our go-to for Chinese names in the SCA right now because it's, it has a lot. I documented my name with it. I, 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 this is my go-to, this is, this is what you do. Um, Ebris illustrated the history of the China, uh, illustrated history of China in the second edition. It's it's just kind of a standard. Most of us most of us in the Eastern Gate have it. Um, the uh, Salviata 
article about the language of adornment I like a lot. It's also good for you scribes. It has a lot of really nice up close pictures of things. I've provided a list of charges just to, to get some people started. You especially want to pay attention to the association between the number five and bats. Um, the number five is, is considered lucky and bats are considered especially lucky. They're often depicted with peaches in artwork, uh, and I forgot to include peaches. Peaches are a totally acceptable fruit to have in, in your artwork, specifically pairs of fish. You don't want to, you want to steer people away from one fish. The, I've seen submissions wherein people have depicted actual humans. I've not seen an actual human on a banner. Uh, I'll get to that question in just one second. They've asked about Chinese characters, and I need to make an important point there. Um, well, we do see human figures on heraldic banners in Europe. Human figures are usually depicted as temple guardians. I've only seen them rarely used, especially after the Song period, which is my period. They're almost always armored. I very rarely see uh, adult female forms. So try to try to steer try to steer people away from that. If what they're going for is is a proper Chinese aesthetic, if they just really want a Chinese woman on their device. I, I mean, you know, do it, do more power to you. I don't particularly think it's a good idea. So we got wheels, pairs of fish, conch shells. Uh, when I say banners, this is in reference to some Taoist symbolism. So that's something to keep in mind. There is there is a, re a religious component to banners. Lotus, peony, cherry, cherry blossoms, plum blossoms are especially uh, figure especially in the artwork. Knots. Usually you see bamboo and pine trees together, but um, since you can only have the one kind of charge, I would just go for one or the other. So written characters, one per device. This is part of the step from period practice, and you have to understand that Chinese characters are going to check for conflict against Japanese kanji. Um, sing any other any other symbol so the the alchemical symbol for sulfur the the astrological symbol for aquarius they're all if you they're all going to account for conflict but it is an extremely correct pro practice to have your name in characters on your banner and uh, you tended to be a, a you know a light set of characters on a dark banner usually light blue um so you can't really register your whole set of name characters as your device, which would be what would actually be period. But you can encourage people to uh, to do that with their camps to create a, a more correct aesthetic. So they can't register that. But there's nothing saying that they can't have them on their camps, and it looks great. Uh, bats, cranes, and number five cicadas, dragonflies. Dragonflies are all over the art. Uh, the colors you want to focus on are red, yellow, black, white, blue, and sun green. I, I have seen only very little purple. Very, it's even more vanishingly rare than in European, European heraldic practice. So, uh, but purple gets you around conflict and people love it. So there's no reason to deny people that. Uh, get creative with rainy and wavy borders on, on submitters items. It, I know that Rayani is not necessarily a thing that they do in in, Europe, in European heraldry until much later, but for your Chinese personas, it's totally applicable all throughout the period. So so get creative, use your Rayani banners. I apologize if if Cormac or Odd are are in this and and cringing at me because because that because uh, I'm encouraging people to do this, but it's not about European heraldry; it's about Chinese heraldry. Um, 
definitely focus on those central circular charges. Obviously, you can't have everything be a circle. My own banner, my, my own device are, is a, a black crown of thorns around a black lotus. Not especially Chinese, but from far away, it does focus on that central, that central motif. So this was supposed to be a workshop, and I am flattered by the turnout, but um, now I would like to, to try to answer some questions. So John, could you, uh, could you throw those at me, please? All right. Uh, so the first question that you missed was, uh, if the beast chart is not easily identifiable to European heralds, is there a route of submission or research you suggest? For example, something that doesn't have a common or universal translation, could you submit something as a vermilion bird and would they not confuse it for a phoenix? So I want to talk about that because there was there was the whole discussion of, of, of firebirds, of Russian firebirds no longer being registrable and then they were brought back and there was just a lot of up and down about that. Um, I encourage people with Chinese personas not to try to register phoenixes, even though this, this is gonna to touch on the idea of appropriation, even though that a phoenix is a perfectly acceptable charge for a European persona, for a Chinese persona that is not acceptable culturally because it is reserved for the Empress. And because we have the, the precedent in place that the five-toed dragon is reserved for the Emperor and therefore will bounce, I am, desperately afraid that you will open up the can of worms of making it so that people can't register phoenixes and there will be a long debate about that and i just encourage people to to think about that when they when they attempt to register a phoenix now that being said i did have a submitter want specifically a vermilion bird now this particular submitter does have chinese in their in their background um we compromised visually from uh, a specific, I want to say that the charge was a, was a dunghill cock. I, I looked for a, a yard bird with a long tail, and that was what I attempted to offer and say, let's go ahead and just register it as this, and then whenever you get it, get it through the college, you can draw it with a nice, lovely tail, and, and it will be a vermilion bird to you. And this is where I got into the to to a submitter being less than less than flexible. Um, but I understand she wanted what she wanted, and that's what she wanted, and she couldn't have it, so she didn't register heraldry. Maybe she'll try again later. I hope she does. Um, I know that was kind of rambling, and I know it didn't really give you anything concrete to go on. The For there, there are everything is a is a case by case basis, and it takes being creative with your with your art and your eye. Um, and like Sophia pointed out, um, we don't really care if it's if it's common. We're concerned about if it's identifiable. Can can we give a blazon to a scribe and the, and then they draw it accurately from those directions? So uh, somebody mentioned wanting to get have a, a Keelan. Um, there, I, I want to say that we've, we've registered those before, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will go again because precedent is always changing. There, the key is to be creative. The key is to look at it from, from a different point of view. Is there something that looks close that we can turn into that after registration is over? So um, next question. Uh, question two, from what sources do you draw these references? By that I mean, what is considered common enough symbology to get submitted as a charge, and how do you prove that in submission? Uh, like you said, human figures are almost only found guarding temples, so that is uncommon, but a mythical beast could be painted multiple places. How common should something be, and how do you prove it common? Okay, so like Sophia mentioned, we're not necessarily concerned about common. We're concerned about identifiability. I reference the phrase common because 
that's going to get a better chance of a of a herald or of a herald or a scribe of a Eurocentric bent to understand what you want. And this process, this thought process, came out of a conversation that I had with Reef not too long ago, wherein the idea is that the a a Chinese person has shown up in a European court and has done something awesome, and a European herald has has uh, in a European monarch has decided to bestow them heraldry through their college of arms, and now a European herald has to suddenly give this Chinese person arms. So it has to be something that we can put in front of an artist and say, can you draw this? Now that being said, again, we're working from a not necessarily heraldic tradition into a heraldic tradition. So the, so the list of charges that I've provided in the document Almost all of these come from that British Museum PDF. And the reason that I've, I've included this PDF is not that it's primary documentation, it's that it's meant to be an inspiration. So the list of charges are all things that if I say to a European herald that, you know, a, a pine tree, they're going to be able to draw that. Um, so it's not, it's not really a question of a source, it's a question of an inspiration. I hope that answered your question. What's next? Uh, we never did do the question of um, appropriation of Chinese culture from right at the start. Okay, well, then let's tackle um, that now. That, that's a philosophical discussion wherein we talk about wealth and i don't mean wealth in the sense of material goods i'm talking about in the sense of power what is the thing that we trade in in the sca and that is intellectual um intellectual renown and and our and our oral tradition so you have to think of appropriation in terms of who has the power and where is it going. When we as, I say we as white people, because I am a white people, no, nobody in the world is going to believe that I'm, that I'm Chinese. Uh, so I do get embarrassed when, when people introduce me as woo out in the world because, because that's sticky. When, when we as white people want to practice extra European personas, we have to be diligent in the idea that we are not commandeering that culture. Uh, we have to be able to step back and, and accept feedback and be willing to be corrected. There's a certain amount of humility that goes into practicing an extra European persona. At the same time, that's not to say not to trust your own your own research. You should definitely trust your research, but, but always be willing to to find out more. As a as a baby Scadian who wants to do a Chinese persona, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you want to delve into something that's an extra European persona. Uh, what, what, we what we generally tend to, to stress in the Eastern Gate is do your best and then do better within the confines of your budget and your abilities. It's better to do a basic thing well than to try to do an elaborate thing poorly, which also fits into the idea of having a Chinese persona. So it's, it's better to have a simple name or simple device or no device at all than to get married to a, a particular idea and be hurt when it doesn't work out. Uh, this is a really broad question and another whole discussion that I'm absolutely happy to have with people uh, when, there's, when there are not other questions waiting. I encourage anybody that wants to talk about this with me to please contact me. What's the next question, John? Uh, well, there was a question about um, a quillin, but uh, it seems to have been answered in chat already. 
So I, I noticed that, that Mr. Salilio was working on that question and I deeply appreciate her being on top of that for me. And that's the last of the questions for now, I believe. Okay. So. All right. So, any, does anybody have a specific name or device that they wanted to work on? I will also mention that we have 15 minutes left in the session. So if there's something that you want me to go back to just to discuss in more detail, I'd be happy to do that. I have a question. Where will the like recording be put? Uh, that will be, honestly, I'm not quite sure. I'm the moderator. I'm not actually part of the, um, I'm not responsible for that one. Uh, but I am sure there will be uh, links posted on the website after the event finishes. Cool, thanks. Yeah, the event staff have been very diligent with that. I think that it'll be pretty easy to find. And if not, I'll definitely put a link to it in the Eastern Gate group. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to find. Anybody else? I saw something flash. I didn't see the whole thing. I guess I just wanted to comment, <clears throat> excuse me, and say thanks for doing this because I think we all have to, those of us who have been in the SCA for a while and were so used to thinking of everything in terms of European heraldry, I, I think it's only going to expand to other cultures in the coming years. And so we just have to expand our knowledge and our practices. Um, I know I start, I, I personally am, you know, not a Chinese persona, but as a Herald, one time I hel helped out at SCA, I mean, at Herald's Point at Penzik, and they had me on armory. And this woman, came, young woman came down and she says, well, I, I'm half Chinese and half Irish, and I would like a device that would show both sides of me. But then it turns out that somehow she got at my table and she hadn't submitted a name yet. So I was able to push her off to the name Heralds because it's like, well, you've got to have a name before we even talk about a device. But that got me thinking, like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you dodged a bullet. Um, in that particular instance, what I would encourage Heralds to do is listen to the person's background and then steer them in, in direct, again, you have to get creative. You have to think outside the box. What I would do for that particular submitter is suggest a green charge. <laughs> I mean, give them a green bat and a nice yep. one. <laughs> yep, green is good. Yep. And Chinese bats are so pretty when you, when you draw them. So they do have to be drawn as, the, as, a, as a bat biologically to a to a European herald. But then once they're past registration, go find that, that beautiful cloud art and do some bats. I have a question. What is the problem with keyring? According to Dai Jiring, uh, they actually are a monster that dates to Chinese antiquity and it gives a list of specific body parts that they are made out of. I'm afraid I don't understand the nature of your question. I'm sorry. Well, Can you say what's the problem? People were saying just a few minutes ago that keyring are, are not available as a charge. And I don't understand why they would not be available as a charge because they're actually, they're described as a, a fairly standard monster. Or at least they're describable and, as a fairly standard monster. Yeah, and, and Lilia brought up a, a good point. Uh, I did happen to just, look up in time to see this flash. We may have to blazon that it has the legs of a X and the, the tail of a Y because that's how they're described and that's how that's how Chinese dragons are described. The, the, the legend goes that dragons are made up of pieces of all of the other animals of the Chinese zodiac which I think is really cute and whimsical. Um, 
so so that would be something we could do is we could we could label the individual parts um yeah I mean, it does have a standard list at least some places yeah, at least this, is, this is a precedent from like 1991. oh and it's so it's, it's an antique it's an antique and just because someone then didn't i mean may have they, they may have drawn it horribly they may have drawn the wrong thing right yeah. they may have misunderstood and put the wrong body parts and claimed it was a kieran when it was nothing of the sort so uh, that precedent is not fatal you just need to do your research and oh, well, document it as a new thing find find yeah. some find, find somebody that wants to have a kieran i will send them documentation It sounds like Solvi. Was that Solvi? Yes, this is the evil solving. <laughs> not evil, not evil at all. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, and like Sophia and, and Lilia were saying, um, just be, just because there's a precedent doesn't mean it can't be overturned. We we just have to be diligent and be willing to 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 do the legwork. It's actually fairly simple legwork if you read Japanese. But that's anyway. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't believe we have any questions in chat at this time. Okay, great. So if you if you didn't get a link to the Google Doc, um, my name is Emily Feathers, like bird feathers on Facebook, and I have Wu in my in my nickname. Uh, you can reach out to me on Facebook. I'm set to uh, I'm set to get PMs from people that, that are not in my friends list, so you should be able to contact me. Uh, my email address is in the Oscar roster, if you have Oscar access. If you don't, and you are a principal or a submissions herald in this chat, and I apologize that my lights keep going out. My apartment is extremely dark, and I've been using the light for my monitors. Um, the, the, uh, I, I go on record as giving a principal or a submissions herald that that can see my email in the Oscar roster to to give that out. Um, I do want to stress that if you are making your own recording of this, because I have heard a couple people mention that they're going to make their own recording that is not through the the recording on uh, for No World Heraldic. Uh, I don't get I don't grant consent for that. So please use the the No World Heraldic recording. Um, I'm sorry that I had to to bring that up, but I did. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about anything that we could, didn't have time to talk about, um, especially appropriation. That's that's a really important thing to talk about. Uh, we didn't even talk about white saviorism, which is what we really deal with a lot in in the the SCA scenology community. The the appropriation really takes the form of white saviorism. That's a whole other discussion. Um, so we have to talk about that at some point. Um, well, you mean Lost Horizon? I'm sorry? Like Lost Horizon. Um, um, and it's probably my phone. I'm I, um, not it's really a, making out. It's a famous, famous movie set in Shangri-La and it, ha it has a it turns out it has a Frenchman running the place. Yes, I just couldn't hear the title that you were talking that you were saying, Sylvie. I'm sorry. It was FDR's favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> Lost Horizon, I believe, is what she said. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sometimes our heroes are problematic, unfortunately. Well, we have about six minutes left. I will I will return everybody to their evening and uh, thank everybody so much for coming. Please, please reach out to me. Uh, I love to talk about these things. So, so we'll see you at the next thing. Enjoy your symposium. <laughs>